All right. Here's where we're headed today. This is the last Sunday that we're talking about church reimagined, all right? We've talked about the mission of our church, which is displaying the irresistibility of Jesus so that lives are transformed. You all get that. You've got it memorized. You've already got your tattoo of that, I'm sure. We've talked about our five values. You guys have all those memorized now. If you missed any of those, go back and take a look at them. So here's what we're talking about today. I'm going to talk about vision. What is vision? It's a mental picture. It's a mental picture of where God is going to take us as a church. But the minute I talk about vision, I have to be super honest with you. And it's this. Most leaders will tell you this. They like change. And whenever you have a vision, particularly a new vision, it involves change. But here's the truth about this. The truth is that people only get get excited about change when they're initiating it. Most other people, when, when you're in your position right now, if you're listening to this, you're like, well, I don't even know the change that's coming, and you're listening to it. All of a sudden, change becomes disruptive to you, because I, I believe this is true. One person's dream is another person's nightmare. It can be, because we're going to ask you to embrace some change. Here's our human tendency. When the change isn't our idea, we resist it. Because it disrupts our routines, our expectations, our schedules, our resources. It could disrupt your community. But when change is our idea, and you know this, when you brought change to your family, hey, we're going to do Christmas different this year, and people didn't embrace it, you got frustrated. So vision's a tricky deal. To say, hey, this is the new vision of our church, and it's, it's going to require some adaptation on our part. Here's where we've been for the last 18 months. Our elders and our staff have been talking about this new vision. We actually had a meeting that you were invited to, that you could come on a Wednesday night, and you gave us tremendous feedback on vision. And we started adjusting our vision for, um, for how it is, just based off of what you told us, you're like, that doesn't make sense. And so we started making adjustments. So thank you for that. So let me just say, you all have either willingly said, yes, I want to participate in the vision and help build it with you, or maybe you missed that meeting. Don't worry about it. We're going to have another one coming up, all right? Uh, One of the things I got to clarify is this, is how vision actually works. Some of y'all think vision's like the book of Exodus, right? God rescues his people. Then there's one dude in charge named Moses. He goes up on a mountain for 40 days, meets with Jesus, comes back with these tablets and this direction from God. And that's vision, right? So your expectation is, I got to go up on a mountain somewhere, pray to God, and come back with like, here's the vision that God gave me. I'd actually prefer if we actually did vision the way the New Testament did vision, as opposed to the way that the Old Testament did vision. And this is what we're going to look at. How did vision work in the New Testament for Paul and his team? I guarantee you it's not what you thought. And so this is where we're going to go today. Um, just for today, I'm going to invite you to do this. Uh, I want you to grab, I want you to grab two things. Inside your notes is this. We'll get to that in just a minute. But inside your notes, uh, you'll find this, our church reimagined vision diagram. Here's what's important about this. I'm going to fly through so many different scriptures today that if I give you time to look them up in your Bible, you will be lost. And so I just want you to follow along right here. They'll be up on the screen. I purposely didn't even do any fill-ins. I know that really disappoints some of you. I apologize. We'll get back to fill-ins next week, and you will open your Bibles next week. But for this week, I have to say this. Just follow along with me, because I'm asking this question. How did vision work for Paul and his team? Well, the first was this. Ready? He had mission clarity. He's praying with this group of people, and this is what it says in Acts 13. It says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. So here's what God did. He called them to a mission. Paul, you're going to go tell people about me and you're going to plant churches. You're going to plant churches all over the place. You're actually going to be the most instrumental person in the history of the church, about planting churches all over the place. So God gives him clarity about the mission that he's on. But he doesn't necessarily tell him where to go. So they just, they pray for him, and they go, go with God. And he starts telling people about Jesus. He goes up north and and west to modern-day Turkey and starts planting these churches. 
They go on this whole mission and then they come back. And then after this whole mission where they plant churches, by the way, this is all based off of the book of 1 Thessalonians. We've been in this book of 1 Thessalonians for six weeks now. This is our seventh week on this. I'm going to tell you about how they actually planted this church and the vision for this church. It started with mission clarity. And then they get back, and they haven't gone to Thessalonica yet. They get back, and Paul has this, maybe it's a conviction. Maybe it's just like a common sense thing, or maybe it's a thought. Listen to what he says, Acts 15, 36. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the believers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord to them, and let's see how they're doing. God didn't tell him anything. He's just like, you know what, this kind of makes sense. Like, we should go visit these people again. It might be conviction, common sense, or just a thought. So they go again. They start traveling. In Acts 16, it reads this way. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia. Having been kept, that word actually means forbidden. Having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in the province of Asia. Stop for just a minute. He got blocked by the Holy Spirit. You know what that looks like? No, you don't. I don't either. He doesn't explain it. I don't know if he's like, he says, blocked by the, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach. So I don't know if it was like this. He got up and he, he's like, hey, we're going to go to this town and preach. And they went there and he went to open his mouth and he goes, and he has laryngitis. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if he walked out of the city to go, go to that city. He's like, boom, runs into a, like an invisible wall. He's like, what is this? He just doesn't say. Or maybe he's like, you know, I, I just have this conviction and God's blocking our time there. He doesn't explain it. All we know is this, he's saying, nope, you're not going there. And then it happens again in Acts 16, 7, under point four. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the spirit of the Jesus would not allow them to, so they passed by Mysia and went down to Troas. He got blocked again, but now in this place it says the spirit of Jesus. Well, why is it the spirit of Jesus and not the spirit, the Holy Spirit? We don't know. He, he just doesn't say. But God stopped him. Oh yeah, I know, Paul, you got this vision, you got this thing, you got this plan, you want to go over here and do this thing, and God's like, no, shuts him down. And then, Paul has a dream. Number five, during the night, Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia standing and begging him to come over to Macedonia and help us. They're not even in Greece yet. They would have to get on a boat and sail to Greece to make this happen. He has a dream. He doesn't say, like, he's laying in bed and he's wide awake and he has this vision or is he sleeping and he dreamt this? It's probably a dream of this person in Macedonia going, hey, come over to us, help us, help us. So they get on a boat and they go to this region of Macedonia. They get to this, this place called um, Philippi. And it's a disaster. It's not a great experience. He is unjustly beaten and jailed and if, when you jump into the, into the story, they literally face rejection in the town. This is what it, it says in Acts 16, 39. They escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. Ultimate rejection by the people. Not, now, they planted a church there, and the Christians there accepted them. But the town, they literally got driven out of the town. But they didn't give up. They passed through two other towns. They finally arrived in this, this place where we've been reading about in the book of First Thessalonians. They arrive at this city called Thessalonica, and on three Sabbath days, they spoke about Jesus in the synagogue. But that also ended with this. Listen to this, Acts 17, 4. Some of the Jews were persuaded, and they joined Paul and Silas, but other Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. They formed a mob, started a riot in the city. There's a riot. They're looking for Paul and Silas, like, let's get them, let's beat them. Paul and Silas, they have to sneak out of the city under the cover of darkness. So what's point number seven? More rejection. This is an amazing vision at this point, isn't it? So about anywhere from four to 12 months goes by. And Paul hasn't revisited Thessalonica. And so he, he sends Timothy. And Timothy goes there and visits. And Timothy brings back this report. The church is doing great, Paul. And so Paul decides to write them a letter and that's where we get the letter of 1 Thessalonians. You with me so far? I know I just gave you like eight steps on something, and you're like, wow, my head is spinning. We're going to go fast this morning. He writes this in that letter. He says, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan blocked our way. 
So uh, can we just review this for a moment? Here's how Paul did vision. First of all, he had mission clarity. I'm about planting churches, telling people about Jesus, and we're going to plant a church, and then we're going to establish leaders there, and we're going to move on. And then at some point, he just used common sense. It seems, makes sense that we should go visit these churches that we started before. We tried to go to a certain area and blocked by the Holy Spirit. Then we were blocked by Jesus. Then I had this weird dream and we followed it. We started planting churches. And then we got rejected in Philippi. We arrived in Thessalonica. We faced more rejection. And he tried to go back there and Satan blocked him from going back. Welcome to Vision 101. I told you, it's not what, what you expected. Because you've read leadership books, right? You've read books on vision. It's like classic, cast a clear and compelling vision for the church to follow. And you're like, yes, but when I read the story of the New Testament, the one thing I can guarantee you is that vision is unpredictable. Sometimes I think we write about vision in such a sure way to sell books. But Proverbs 16, 9 clears it up. You ready? It says this, in their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. What does that mean? You can plan all you want. God gets the last word. He might shut you down and block you when you think that that's the path you're supposed to go on. It's interesting, though, because sometimes it was Satan himself that blocked Paul. Well, how does Satan do that? Don't know, have, don't have any idea. Was it an illness? I don't know. Was it just, a, you know, enemies? People in the city, like if he went back to Thessalonica, they would surely have killed him. We just don't know. We just know this. Vision, it's complicated, and it's messy, but that's so good because of this. If we think God wants to give us this big vision for our church, and he's like, hey, here's what the next 20 years looks like, now go live it out, why would we ever live in dependence upon him if he told us exactly what we, where we were going and what would happen? Here's God's design for vision. Lean on him. Pray. Talk to him. Let, let me just show you real quick how we're going to do it in our church. One, we're going to clarify our mission and values. We've done that. Number two, we're going to do this. We're going to ask for God's direction, and we're going to listen. We're going to lean on him. John 15 talks about stay connected to this vine that is Jesus. Remain in him. Apart from him, you can do nothing. The third thing, we're going to look for opportunities, and we're going to try stuff. That doesn't sound very biblical, does it? We're going to try stuff. In, 19, uh, in the 1950s, there was this, uh, this New York interior designer, and this designer wanted to uh, create a new kind of textured wallpaper, and uh, it totally failed. Nobody bought it. Nobody was interested in it, and it was years later that uh, two of these inventors, a guy named Mark Chavanis and Al Fielding, saw this wallpaper, and they had a different vision that tur in turned into an annual revenue of $4 billion. What was it? Bubble wrap. You know the stuff that protects your dishes or protects fragile things? You know the stuff that you get and you're like, I know you say your kids do this, they just pop it and it's like addicting to pop. It's addicting for me too, I just gotta like pop. Designed to be wallpaper in the 1950s. But someone took a failed idea because someone ran down a road to try stuff. And it turned into something fabulous, but used totally differently. Do you know what we're going to do at our church? We're going to try stuff. We're going to pray, ask for God's wisdom and vision. We're going to try stuff. And if he blocks us, fantastic. We're going to go the other way. We're going to pay attention to the opportunities that he brings our way. And I'll get how that has worked for us. Number four, we're going to change directions when blocked. Number five, we're going to hold the vision loosely because the vision will change. Our mission doesn't change. Our mission is we're going to display the irresistibility of Jesus to people until their lives are transformed. We're going to watch people get saved, grow to maturity, and see their lives be different. That will never change for us. But the last thing is this. We're never going to give up. You never give up your mission. You'll change directions oftentimes. And what I'm about to show you in the vision of our church is how we're changing direction. Um, and let me just add this to you. This isn't just about vision for our church. Do you have a vision for your career? What about a vision for your marriage? 
Do you teach your kids how to have vision? Do you, are you at a level at a company where they look for your opinion about the vision for your company? What if you took these principles and said, you know what, I, I want vision for my family, I want vision for my marriage, I want vision for my career, and what if you started applying these? Because sometimes I think we just want the next 20 years laid out and, and have abundance of clarity. Know who you are in Christ, what he's gifted you at and what he's called you to, but you got to hold vision loosely and try some stuff because God will direct you along the way. Um, so here's Church on the Hill's vision. Over the last 18 months, our staff and elders have been talking this through, praying this through. One thing has become abundantly clear to us, and it's this. We are a spiritual formation church. We want to have pathways that help people grow spiritually. Want, we want them to meet Jesus, grow to maturity, and then help other people. We are a spiritual formation church because when people follow Jesus, their lives are transformed. And here's what's interesting. God has actually just brought some opportunities our way in the last three to four months that are all about transformation. And so here's how we're gonna say it. Church on the Hill's vision, pretty simple. It's about life transformation, it's about village transformation, and it's about land transformation. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about this morning. I am gonna, I'm gonna fly through this, so you will miss some of this. Uh, if you want to do this, pull, this would be a great time to probably pull this out, because this is all about life transformation, and on the back you'll see um, village transformation, land transformation. By the way, there's a timeline for each of these. Life transformation, we've already been doing this for years, and we will continue to do this till Jesus comes back. Village transformation, it's about a three-year process. Land transformation, it's going to be more like 10 to 15 years down the road. So let me walk you through each of these. Life transformation. Jesus changes people. Amen? Hopefully he's changed you. I'm hoping he's still changing you. Because if you think you are now arrived at the saint that he intended you to be, maybe he has more for you. So let's talk about life transformation. Because there's transformation, we want to create a path for transformation. Where do you start? Where does the path go? Now, the minute you create a path, just understand this. God may work outside that path. He guaranteed will. But it doesn't mean that we don't have a clear path. So here it is. We talk about the four Ds. It's about discover, deepen, display, and develop. Let me walk you through that. Discover is this. It's about discovering God, and we do it in two ways. Right here at our weekend gathering, you're discovering God right now. We also do it through our spiritual habits. Now, our weekend gathering, when you hear the word discovering God, I guarantee there's some of you who are like, I've been going to church for 20 years. I don't need to discover God. Yes, you do. You think 20 years is all it takes for someone to plumb the depths of who God is? What he's called you to? I've been walking with Christ for way more than 20 years. And I feel like every week I'm discovering new things about who he is and what he wants from my life. So our weekend gatherings, they're going to do this. They are for the unchurched and the dechurched. The unchurched, people who've never been to church. This gathering is also for the de-churched. I used to go to church, but I gave up on the church a long time ago. Somebody wasn't mean to me, and I stopped going. Or my life hit some really rough spots, and I felt like God let me down. So there's unchurched and de-churched people that need to discover the true God of the Scriptures and the God who created this world and the God who sent his son, Jesus. But please don't miss this. Our gathering right here is also for believers who've been walking with Christ for 40 years. because you need to keep discovering him in a fresh way. I know I've been accused of, um, accused may be strong. Um, people said, well, you know what? I feel like Sunday morning's all for de-churched and unchurched people. Um, I will tell you this, I wanna teach the scriptures in such a way that I put it on the bottom shelf so that those who don't necessarily have a church background, that they understand what we're talking about. If we don't do that, then all we've done is created a holy huddle that, yes, we're equipping the saints of God, but where do you bring your friends to if they don't have a place to go to church where when they walk in, you're a little embarrassed because you're like, let me, I'll have to explain all that stuff to you because I know like half of what the pastor was talking about, the sanctification of believers, like you'd have no idea what that means. So I just want to talk about it in real authentic terms 
so that it makes sense to people. I'll be very clear about it. It ain't dumbing down the Bible, okay? Sorry, that um, I got a little intense. I didn't mean it to. I just want to be really clear about it. Here's the other thing. Discovering God, it doesn't just happen here on Sunday morning. We're going to talk about spiritual habits. I want to give you tools so that you can read the Bible for yourself and understand it. Come on. If we're really honest, some of y'all put way too much pressure on me. I know we don't talk about this, right? But you put pressure on Sunday morning to be like, Pastor, I really want you to feed me on Sunday morning. I'd be like, oh, how long have you been a Christian? Like 15 years. Could you imagine a 15-year-old waking up in the morning and being like, Mom, feed me. Feed yourself. Hey, Christian, you've been walking with Jesus for some time? Feed yourself. And I'm, ten, I'm not saying I don't want to feed you. I don't want to come together on Sunday morning and like not feed you. I do desperately. I want your soul to be fed in this moment. But if you're placing all of your spiritual growth on a message that you're going to hear for 30 minutes, we, we have to grow up. And feed ourselves. So I want to help you with these daily habits of how you're going to grow in Christ. We'll give you things like life journals. We'll teach you the SOAP method. We want to use the version app so that you have Bible reading plans that you can do together. Um, we want to teach you about worship-based prayer. That's discovering God. I'm going way too deep into this. I, I need to keep cranking through this. So after discovering God, it's about deepening your faith, and we do it in groups, community groups. We already have these. This is something that we're doing. By the way, when we talk about vision, there's some things that are actual. We're already doing them. And there's other things that are aspirational. We're aspiring to do these things. We're not doing them yet. Community groups, we're already doing. But we're going to include what we're going to call deepen you courses. Because sometimes you need something else like a Bible study on a topic or to understand what the Old Testament was. Like some of y'all, you have no idea what the storyline of the Old Testament is. And it would really help you because when you read the Old Testament, you're like, I have no idea what I'm reading. Well, what if we had a course for that to help you? Uh, what if we had a course for teaching you how to read the Bible for yourself? Um, sometimes it might be New Testament 101. These are Bible studies that will help give you some tools to grow in Christ. Here's the, uh, the third group. So there's community groups, deep and you courses. The last one is life groups, and I'm pretty pumped about these. It's where you turn your life experience into compassion. Um, I think a life group, you have neighbors, right? You don't live in a cave by yourself, right? You have neighbors that are close to you. They deal with stuff in life. The things that they deal with in life when they're de churched and unchurched, sometimes they deal with the same stuff that you do. Where their life and your life overlap, we want to call those life groups. Let me give you some examples. Mops. Mothers of preschoolers. You know, a lot of moms of preschoolers, they deal with all the same stuff, whether they're Christ followers or not. And so I would say this, we need a mops group. If that's a ministry that we want to have, I know that we have some mothers of preschoolers here in the room. Um, this is where you take your life experience and you're going to lead the group, not me. I'm totally disqualified from leading a mops group but you're uniquely qualified to. Divorce care. You see, when people get divorced, oftentimes they become desperate enough to say, I'll even try the church. Grief share. It's when someone passes away and you've had loss in your life or you're dealing with some kind of grief, whether maybe it's over illness or sickness, and you just don't know how to process your grief. People who are outside the church, they're sometimes desperate enough to try the church at that moment. Marriage, parenting, financial issues, anxiety, addiction, all of these are your life experience. And you can start a group and turn your life experience into compassion for somebody else. Um, let me just give you a, um, maybe a quick example of this. Uh, when we started talking about grief share months ago, my wife, uh, she's been through grief. She lost her brother when he was uh, about 19 and she was about 16. And she went through the process of that grief. And I know that she wishes she would have had a resource around her, some people who could have shepherded her through what the stages of grief look like. And so when she listens to this, uh, she's still, <laughs> she's at a place now where we're kind of re-entering grief as we're dealing with some um, memory loss issues with her dad. And so she's at a unique place right now. Where she's like, I'm going to take my personal experience 
Now, I'm going to turn it into compassion for other people. So we're looking at starting this grief share group in January. We'll see. I mean, it depends on if that's something that you need and you decide to sign up for it. But that's why one of the reasons why Christina, just a moment ago, she announced that on November 9th, we're going to have this surviving the holidays. Because there's, there's lots of people who struggle with the holidays. Sometimes as people going through grief, you lost somebody, that means this Christmas is going to be different than any other Christmas. People who've been divorced, um, sometimes that is a really difficult season for you. And we don't want to get together and just sing joy to the world if you don't feel that joy to the world inside you. Don't worry, we'll get together and still sing joy to the world, okay? But I'm wondering if some of us need to join a one-day event about surviving the holidays to hear that there's other people going through what you're going through. Does this make sense? A life group is started by you. And so here's what I want you to do. Let me just invite you to do this. That connect card in front of you, every single person, ready? I'm talking to all of you. You two in the balcony, grab it, pull it out right now. There's probably a pen or pencil there. You're welcome to give us feedback on any of this vision. I'm only partway through this. But I also want to say this. Is there anything about your experience and some of the groups that we've listed that you would either like to attend or maybe you would help to like lead those? Let us know. I want you to write down there. And maybe by writing this down, hey, grief share, divorce care, maybe it's a mops group. It's an invitation to you to start a conversation with one of our staff that would say, tell us about your experience and how do we bring people together in this? And if you don't want to lead it, you're just like, I, I'd be interested in attending that. I want you to write that down and let us know, okay? I need to really get moving. Discover God deep in faith, displaying Jesus. Here's how this happens, three areas. The first is you and your neighborhood. <laughs> and by neighborhood, I mean, maybe it's your cubicle. Because <laughs> for a large part of the day, that's your neighborhood, right? Maybe it is on the street, the condos, apartments where you live. This is you displaying the irresistibility of Jesus to people so that eventually you might win them over. Let me say it this way. When you do nice things for people, we'll just call them good acts. Good acts lead to goodwill. And goodwill, it earns the right to share good news. And that good news is always about Jesus. So that's your neighborhood. We also do this in our city, but we do it together. You, you guys have been a part of, you've heard announcements. Hey, there's a, a project in the city. We're all going to go do this. We're going to repaint or redo the inside of a, a room for this house where uh, single moms live with their kids. And many of you participate in stuff like that. Why do we do that? Well, because the goodwill that we offer in that leads to an opportunity to share the good news of Christ. Um, we also do this around the world. We have global partners around the world that we're displaying Jesus to the world. Right now, we have one of our outreach teams in Mexico. Um, so discover, deepen, display, and here's the last D. It's developing leaders. We're going to develop leaders in two ways. Here's the first way. We're going to have probably four a year, and they're going to be the same kind of vision meeting we did last month. The next one's coming up. It's at the end of uh, either beginning of December. I think uh, November 30th, I think, is when it is. It's a Wednesday night, and we're going to talk about vision. And here's what we're going to do at these vision gatherings. Um, we're, we're going to keep it very simple. We're going to ask you to help us shape our vision. We're going to ask you to join our vision, and we're going to celebrate the wins along the way. I'm pretty excited about this because here's what we've done inadvertently at our church, and forgive me for doing this, but this is what we did. Um, we had like the elders and the, the pastors and our executive team over here creating vision. And then over here was everybody else. And we're like, this is where we build the vision. And then we look at you and we're like, come on, follow. No, you have great ideas. And so we're inviting you to the leadership table to shape the vision together. So I, I hope you'll join that. Um, November 30th, this is when we're going to meet on that. There's a lot more I could say about life transformation, but I'm going to stop there. Discovering God, deepening our faith, displaying Jesus, and developing leaders. Um, that's all life transformation. Village transformation. I'm going to run down this really fast. We ran into this opportunity. God kind of dropped it in our lap. Before we were in Nicaragua, that story has pretty much come to an end. The people that were on the ground there with us, they're no longer living in Nicaragua, <laughs> the leaders of that. But we've been introduced to this uh, organization in Guatemala called World Help. My wife and I and Susan Ellis, we all went down there to check this out. And it is this amazing engine that is doing Village transformation 
in partnership with churches here in the United States. That's us. Uh, let me show you what I mean by this. This is what we saw. This is a school. 90 degrees out, 90% humidity, a sheet metal school. You imagine how hot it gets. The inside of the building looks like this. Dirt floors, you'll be anywhere from 45 to 60 kids in a classroom. When we do a village transformation, we will usually start with either water, because they don't have running water, clean running water in their village, or we start with a school. Here's what an inside of a school that's been transformed looks like. Very different, right? Here's what the outside of the school looks like. Once the school and the water is established, they will also build a church. They never start with the church. But when they have a pastor, they will take the church that they previously were meeting in. And this is, go to the next picture, Dave. Uh, this is what a church looks like. It's just a metal roof, poles in the ground, and nothing against that, but that little church, every family like brought a piece of timber from that village, and then somebody had enough money to buy the roof for it. They built that church as a community. But when they partnered with a church, look what they were able to build. Americans didn't build that. The locals built that that was funded by a church in the U.S. That's the outside of the church right there. Um, this guy's name is Daniel. This is his family, Daniel and Wilma, and their four kids. He's the pastor of that church. So they meet inside that church, and, and when it rains, and it rains sideways often in Guatemala, remember the, the outside door church with just the roof? Like, sometimes they would just have to shut church down. The weather was just too bad. They can now meet indoors. This whole thing is possible because there's a group down there called Hope of Life. It's an organization that is a powerful engine because they partner with American churches. Uh, I know some of you have sponsored kids. It's been a part of our vision at our church. We sponsor kids in Nicaragua through Compassion International. We have a kid right now st still that we sponsor. We're going to shift gears, and we're going to keep our kid, all right? We're not, like, giving up on her. <laughs> but we're also going to sponsor for $35 a month kids in the village that we're doing transformation in. In the next three years, we have the opportunity to transform a village. So let me tell you what that actually requires. In three years, it'll cost $35,000 a year to do all of these building transformations, somewhere between $100,000 and $130,000, and uh, it'll transform a water well, school, church, put a pastor in that town. Here's what's great. When we raise the money, when we hit $30,000, we will send that down there to an organization that we now know and trust, and they'll start the transformation in the village. And you know what we get to do? We get to go visit them. And we get to go see this village that's been transformed, at least started to be. You'll be able to walk in a school building where kids now have a, a great place to go to school, where they now are able to drink clean water from a tap instead of their moms walking a mile or two miles to the river that's not clean, and doing that every day so that they can drink water. We can be a part of someone's village transformation. Um, I'll come back to this in just a moment uh, about what this will take for us. Life transformation, village transformation, here's the last one, land transformation. You came to church today on approximately 19 acres that is geographically right in the center of San Jose. Let me tell you what we're currently using it for. We obviously use it for church. We have renters on our property here. Uh, there's, some, there's a soccer club that uses the field outside here. Uh, our lower campus, that we rent to this organization called Shuren. It's a Chinese immersion and Spanish immersion school. But we also rent our building over here on this side to a, a Spectrum school. It's a, a school for kids who have uh, emotional, sometimes mental, physical challenges. Um, and we've loved partnering with them. But they're renting part of this facility, and we really like their causes. So this isn't against them, but I'm asking this question. What does God want us to use this property for? To greater increase life transformation in our city. So here's the good news. Um, we have about $1.2 million of debt from about 25 years ago and stuff that we were building on our campus. In the next five years, because of the renters that we have, that debt's going to be totally wiped out. We're going to be debt-free. That's just if we stay how we're doing things right now. That's fantastic news. This church hasn't been out of debt in a long time. But then that income may still be coming in, 
And the question is, what are we going to use this land for? And here's my answer. I have no idea. God hasn't given us that yet. I know this as I walk my neighborhood and I walk and I see um, my, my friends who are in their garages working because they're working from home now. They're remote workers. And their garages are set up as their offices. What if we had space where we could rub shoulders with the community because we invited them into our, our work hub, our community center, where now they come in and they have space that maybe even they rent, but we all work together collectively in, in similar space. Because the truth is, this hill, church on the hill, the church sits up on a hill and it's so removed from the neighborhood. I can't throw a rock and hit a house. They're so far away from us. And maybe it's a rec center. I don't know. Maybe it's a community center. But whatever it is God wants, I just know this. We're going to get out of debt and God wants us to transform the land that we're on so that there's more life on this hill. I don't know what it looks like. But this is 10 to 15 years from now. But I really believe this, that I don't think God would put us in the center, geographically in the center of the city, if he doesn't want us to use this for some kind of life transformation in this city. So let me wrap this up. I know this has been long, and I know this has felt a lot more like a vision cast than a message, and I will not apologize for that because I think God wants us to be really, really clear about where we're headed. And where we're headed is life transformation and village transformation and land transformation. And you know when we're going to start all these three? Now. Now. Here's what it's going to take, though. It's going to take two things. Here's the first one. It's going to take an absolute act of God. Hey, Dave, I'll come to that in just a minute. It's going to take an act of God because the truth is I can't do this. Our staff can't do this. When I look around this room, I see all of you. The truth is this. We cannot collectively as a group of people, we can't do this. We don't have what it takes to do land transformation. I'm not even sure we have what it takes to do village transformation. It's going to take an act of God, so I'm going to ask you, fervently pray for this. Fervently pray for this. Because there's people in Guatemala that I believe God wants us to help. Fervently pray for this. Because I believe that this church was designed to be a legacy for this city, not just for you and me. So I'm going to invite you to pray like crazy. Here's the other thing. It's the second part. This will take a financial engine greater than we, what we currently have. When I was a teenager, I drove this Mazda B2200 truck. Super slow. I mean, manual transmission, it, it, that thing, man, started going up a slight grade and you're like, blah, 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 blah. like the engine was small. Today, I drive a Tundra. Super fun. And while staying within the speed limit, that thing's fast. It can actually haul a load. Why? It's a bigger engine. My question is, what kind of engine do we have here at this church? We need a bigger engine than what we have right now to pull off this dream and this vision. Engine size is determined by two things. Here it is. Number one, earning capacity. Wow, pastor's getting real right now. <laughs> Just depends on how much money is in our pockets, right? You know what's great? As I've got to know some of you, some of you are good at this. Some of you are good at earning money. You know what you should do? Go make a mess of it. I'm called by Jesus. I'm going to go make a mess of money. You should. Why not? You're good at it. Go make a whole load of it. All of us, though, this vision is not dependent on a couple of us making a load of money. It's dependent on all of us asking God, what is my earning capacity? And then it's this question. Because it's not just based off of earning capacity. It's based off of this. Generosity. Because there's people all over the Bay Area that can make a ton of money. It doesn't mean that God can do anything with it. Until we say, God, here you go. This is yours. And the New Testament, the base, the place where we start because of what I've read, my wife and I have always said this. We start at 10% and we give it away. It's called a tithe. It's called a tithe for a reason. Tithe means 10%. So we just give it. 
But now, here's the beauty of this. You know what you're giving to. Life transformation, village transformation, and land transformation. So I want you to ask the question honestly. This vision is going to take an engine that is greater than the capacity of this room. It will require an act of God, but second, it will require generosity. Dave, bring that last slide up here and we'll finish with this. I want to make it really clear about how to give because if I don't tell you how to do this, let me show you what this is. When you go on our site to give, you'll get to the, uh, our giving page and there's categories to select what you want to give to. The Church on the Hill, that's life transformation. That's our general fund. That budget's somewhere between $1.2, $1.3 billion a year. Global outreach, um, that's where we support all of our missionaries, our global partners. That's about 10% of our budget. It's about $120,000 a year. Benevolence, there's a fund there that we invite you guys to give to. And uh, when, we, when you have financial needs, or sometimes people in the city have financial needs, they'll come to us and say, you know what, I, I can't pay rent this month. This is, I got hurt and I've been off work. And we're like, here you go. We don't give them money directly. We actually pay some of their bills for them. You give that so that we can help people in need. Village transformation. You can give directly to it. When that number hits about $30,000, we'll start the village transformation. And we'll start planning our trip to go there as well. Land transformation. Remember, that's a three-year project that we're going to start as soon as we fund it. Land transformation. That's going to be a long, long project that God hasn't made clear to us yet. But I'm going to say, let's fund it now. Let's start giving to it, even if it's a small amount. Can I just give you a very blunt, practical way? If you're already giving to this church, thank you. I love the support. Um, you're not giving to us, though. Let's be real clear. You are giving to God. This is his funds. We just get to manage it. You're not giving to us so that we can do a project. You're giving so that lives are transformed, and you're giving out of obedience to who God, what God has called you to. By the way, Iglesia Soba Loruca is our Spanish church. They meet here. They give towards that. In very practical terms, if you've been giving, um, don't start taking from one fund and just shuffling it to another fund. I'm asking this question. When you give to our general budget, life transformation, church on the hill, would you go above and beyond so that a village can be transformed. Because it doesn't do any good to take away from what we're currently giving to so that we're doing life transformation and just put it someplace else. Ask the question, what's my earning capacity? And what's my generosity capacity? I know there's some uh, uh, who come to church and you're maybe brand new to this whole thing and you might be suspicious of us. Do I trust you enough with finances? I would invite a dialogue with you. Keep coming. Watch how we, I mean, we really have open books at our church to say, if you want to know how we have integrity in our finances, we're willing to show you that. I believe God's called this church to something amazing about life transformation, village transformation, and land transformation. And I hope you'll join in with us. At the end of November, we're going to have this, another vision meeting. And I would just ask, what do you want to do? That card you're holding right now, if you have questions, write your questions down. Please write a contact for us, an email, something like that. Um, if you want to participate and turn some of your life experiences into compassion, tell us how, and we'll start that conversation with you. I've utilized um, all of our time today, but I believe this. Because of this moment in the life of our church, we're going to step into this vision and just see what God blocks and see what he opens up. And I hope you'll do it with us to see that lives are going to be changed. Let me pray. God, <clears throat> I don't know what you will do with this moving forward. I have seen it firsthand in Guatemala. When we drive into a village and people gather around because they're in need and they're hungry. And I want to be the kind of church that has a big enough engine to help. So God, would you bless that? God, I don't know what you'll do with this land, but we want to utilize it and maximize its benefit so that more lives are transformed. It's not about us, God. And I pray for us in this room that, God, we are willing to, to have our own lives transformed, God, that we would live in submission to you. Give us the courage and the wisdom to know how to invite our neighbor into that. 
God, I know that this has been a drinking from the fire hose this morning. But for everybody in this room, Lord, would you put the, their, your finger on one thing in their life that you want to, them to take a next bold step in? And Jesus, in all this, we're going we're gonna to pray to you and we're going to listen for your direction. Would you lead us? This is not our church. This is your church. And so we follow you. If you agree with that, would you simply say amen?